All right, you got three years, man. You're going to live them anyways. Devote those three years to setting the world up around you so that it's the best it could possibly be for you. As if you were taking care of yourself, as if you cared for yourself. Well, what would that look like? You know, let's say, just for the sake of argument, if you figured out where you were, that you could have what would be best for you. Well, what is that? I bet you, you never asked. People don't ask. And so life comes at them like random snakes and they sort of fend them off. And life goes by and things don't work out the way people expected them to. But a huge part of that is they didn't know where they were because they wouldn't look or didn't know that they should look. Ignorance and willful blindness, right? Two great catastrophes. And they never figured out where they wanted to go or why. Now, there's a problem with figuring out where you want to go. And the problem is, is that you make your conditions for failure clear to yourself. And people don't like that. So if you keep yourself in the fog, then you can't tell when you screwed up. Now, that isn't so good because you're still screwing up. You're just too blind, self-blind to notice. Although, in, in, in the short term, that's less painful. If you make your criteria for success razor sharp, then you know every time you screw up. But that's great, because then you could fix it. You could either repair the, the, the behavioral inadequacy or the conceptual inadequacy that you're using as a tool in that situation, or maybe you could adjust your damn plan. Either way, you can fix it. And so, okay, so you're living in one of these bloody things, and you might as well, it seems to me, you might as well make it the best one you could live in because you don't have anything better to do. Now, if you don't do that, if you don't do it consciously, and, and this is what the psychoanalyst pointed out, is that you have innumerable quasi-autonomous subsystems that make you up that will generate stories impulsively and you'll just act them out. And you know that because you watch yourself over two weeks and you think, Jesus, I did a lot of stupid things in the last two weeks. And you think, why? And it's because you're a random, you're a collection of somewhat random, quasi-autonomous personality units. And lacking a leader, they're just going to fire off whenever they want. You know, first you're hungry, then you're thirsty, then you want to go to bed with your wife, you know. Then you want to sleep in, then you want to tell your boss off, then you want to curse at the guy that cuts you off in traffic. It's like, you're kind of like a two-year-old. You know, just it's one emotional frame after another vying for dominance. There's no overarching hierarchy and there's no king at the top. I've, I've been telling people online in various ways and in lectures that they should start fixing up the world by cleaning up their room. And I wanted to just elaborate on that a little bit before I get back to the lecture itself. So. Because it's become this internet, weird internet meme, you know, uh, and, 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 and it's a joke, and good, it's a joke. I, I, I'm really happy about the fact that so much of this has got, like, the leaven of humor in it. It's really important, because that's what stops things from degenerating into, into conflict, to humor. And I was thinking about this idea of cleaning up your room in relationship to the mustard seed idea. And you see, the thing about cleaning up your room, this is also something I learned from Carl Jung, and his studies on alchemy, because for Jung, when the alchemist was attempting to make the philosopher's stone, he was not only engaged in the transformation of the material world, but he was engaged in a process of self-transformation that occurred at the same time as the, as, the chemical as the chemical transformation. So it was a psychological work in some sense. Let's say you want to sort out your room and beautify it, because the beauty is also important. And let's say that all you have is just a little room, like you're not rich, you're, you're poor. And, and you don't have any power, that's another thing. But you've got your damn room, and you've got this space right in front of you, you know, that, that, that's a part of the cosmos that you can come to grips with. And you might think, well, what's there in front of you, right in front of you? And the answer to that is, it depends on how open your eyes are. That, that's the proper answer, because you could say, and w William Blake said this, for example, and Aldous Huxley made comments that were very similar, that in a transcendent state, you can see infinity in the finite. And, you might say, well, you can, say in, you can see infinity in what you have within your grasp if you look. And you could say, maybe that's the case with your room. And so, you want to clean up your room. Well, okay, how do you do that exactly? Well, a room is a, room is a place to sleep. And so, if you set your room up properly, then you figure out how to sleep and when you should sleep and how you should sleep. And then, 
you figure out when you should wake up and then you figure out well what clothes you should wear because they have to be arranged properly in your dresser and then you have to have some place to put your clothes and if you're going to have some clothes you have to figure out what you're going to wear those clothes to do right and then that means you have to figure out what you're going to do and then your room has to serve that purpose because otherwise it isn't set up properly and if it doesn't set up if it doesn't serve your pur- purposes you will be unhappy and not happy in the room because the way that we perceive the world is as a place to move from point A to point B in and then if the place that we're in facilitates that movement then we're happy to be there and if the place that we're in serves as an obstacle to that movement then we're unhappy to be there and so what it means to set up your room is that you have to have somewhere to go that's worthwhile or you can't set up your room and then your room has to be set up to facilitate that and then the next thing is well maybe you have to make it beautiful but that's not easy right that means you have to have some taste and that doesn't mean you have to have money it doesn't because you can be garish with money and you can be tasteful with nothing all you need is taste and taste beats money when it comes to beautifying things you know i mean not that money is trivial because it's not but taste is crucial and people who are very artistically oriented can make beautiful things out of virtually nothing and not only that the literature suggests that if you're going to make beautiful things putting real constraints on on what you allow yourself to do facilitates creativity instead of interfering with it because let's say you have to make something out of nothing right which i suppose would be a godly act right you have to make something out of nothing it, you have to be creative in order to do that and so then to to beautify your room means that you also have to develop your capacity to be creative and so then you can make your room shine but then what will happen is that if your family isn't together they will interfere with that you'll interfere with that because you won't have the discipline to do it properly but then when you start building this 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 little microcosm of perfection with what you have at hand then it'll evoke all the pathologies of everyone in your household they'll wonder what the hell you're up to in there and they won't necessarily be happy because if you're if they're in a lowly place let's say and so are you and you're trying to move out of that then the the higher you move out of that the more the place they're in looks bad and you might say well what they should do is celebrate your victory over chaos and evil but that is <laughs>
plan your day much or your time generally? Does this lead to higher productivity? Yes, I plan my day obsessively. My calendar is always absolutely full and often weeks in advance. And I plan in the morning, especially when I'm on top of things. Uh, and I plan each hour and I probably plan each minute. And yes, it leads to way higher productivity. You know, you, you decide what your goals are going to be. You place them in the calendar. Use the calendar as your friend, eh? Because what you want to do with the calendar is design a day that you want to have or a day that would be good for you. And a day that would be good for you is one that you're, that you're, uh, you know, when you end the day, you feel that you've moved, moved yourself ahead towards your valued goals and that you've kept chaos under control. And that enables you to sleep soundly and with a good conscience and to know that the next day is going to be at least. not worse than that day. Planning is unbelievably useful. And again, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record with regards to the future authoring program, but it really is useful. You know, you need to figure out what it is that you're aiming at and why. And then you need to figure out how you're going to break that down over the months and the weeks and the days. But I would approach your calendar like it's your best friend. You think, okay, I'm going to design a week, man, that I really want to have. And that means you can schedule in leisure and all the things that you want to do, which which you absolutely should do. And it's also quite fun to um, give yourself minimal time to do something complicated because it's quite challenging to see if you can do far more than you thought in far less time.